thank God for you who have come from the other churches to visit with us, to worship with us. Amen. How are you doing since Bushman? <laughs> Just check. Love you. You say mama right, the whole house is right. learning still. <laughs> Amen. What a privilege it is once again to open up God's word today just, just, just to remind us how much God loves us. We've had an awesome Sabbath school lesson with Zachariah and I, I was listening and the Sabbath school class wanted me to get involved. And as I was listening they were just giving me sermon material. <laughs> I didn't want to give it out just to them, but I wanted to share it with you all as well. Amen. It's powerful what God wants to do for us. Day to day for a little while, I'm not going to keep you long. However, I want to open up God's word, just remind us from God's word, the power that's there. I want to talk about the confession of a believer. Confession of a believer. Let's bow our heads for one prayer. Father, we thank you for the joy that we find in knowing you. And we thank you even now for the privilege of opening your word. It's because of your goodness that we're not consumed. And so, Father, as we come and as we enter into this moment where we will hear from you, we pray for insight and wisdom. We pray for your Holy Spirit to come and minister to us in a way that only he can. We pray that you'll make the word so simple and so clear that a child could not hear. And we'll be careful to give you the glory and the honor for what you shall do for us in these moments we have together. We bless you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. As you read the book of Psalms, you will quickly discover that it is a transparent book. It is a book where one cries out to God and lament on several occasions. The psalmist is not afraid to express his grief and his transparency. He's not afraid to tell you how he feels. Sometimes as believers, we want to cover it up or sugarcoat how we feel. People ask us how we're doing, we say fine. How you doing, we smile. Really deep down inside, they ask us, we might be hurting. The psalmist opens up his heart and he expresses his grief. In fact, you can do this. When people ask you how you're doing, you should just ask them, how much time do you have? <laughs> For the truth of the matter, we all have burdens on our hearts. We all have concerns. And sometimes it's enough to confuse you. It's enough to discourage you. It's enough to cause you to want to turn in and throw in the towel. Truth be told, you're only here by the mercy of God. Some of us wanted to give a long time ago, but we've come too far now to quit. You find discouragement in the church and sometimes it's your very members who get on your last nerve. I know you don't want to be honest, but if you tell the truth of the matter, if you just start confessing really how you feel, you'll be able to understand how the psalmist, in fact he says in Psalm 77 verse 1, he said, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. I'm glad God listens to us when we cry and I want you to know there's not one of us today who cry out to God and he does not listen to your prayer. Whenever you call out, God stops whatever he's doing to hear your prayer. I'm so glad we serve a God who answers prayer. But the psalmist said, I cried to God. I was burdened and I had a problem. In fact, in verse 2 he says, in the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord 
my soul, my soul ran in the night. And, and the Bible says, and cease not, my soul refused to be comforted. There comes a time in all of our lives, no matter how much we do, it seems like it's not enough. It seems like we go through trials and burdens and tribulation. It seems like even in the house of God, we have situations that we don't understand and we can't figure out and we don't know how long. And we are troubled in our spirit, but we just sometimes don't know where to go. He said, I remember God and I was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. In other words, he says, I was looking to God, but I was still overwhelmed. You can be a Christian and still have problems. Amen. Sometimes we believe that even as Christians, we think that it's always going to be all right. Amen. But it's all right to cry sometimes. It's, it's all right to hurt sometimes. It's all right to let somebody know how you feel. Now, you've got to be careful sometimes in who you talk to, but... There are burdens on everybody. In fact, as I said before, we all are going through something. And I dare say that you're either in something right now or you're about to go into something or you just came out of something. Everybody is dealing with something. Amen. Truth be told, sometimes you just want to just cry out, God, have mercy, help me, God. What am I going to do? Sometimes you just got to find a prayer closet all by yourself and call out on God. Because I want you to know, yes, as humans, we all go through something. Yes, we all are going through something. In fact, I said before, we always talk about it's always one thing after another. You hear the litany? It's always something. It's going to be something. As long as you're living on planet Earth, it's always going to be something. Amen. Amen. Get ready. Well, it's going to be something after the service. Something might be bothering you right now. Your cell phone going to go off and somebody going to give you something and it's going to be something. In fact, they say it's one thing after another. Just let me give you a reality check. I told you before, I like it like that. One thing after another. One thing after another. I, I like it like that. I don't know about you, say, but don't get it twisted. I like it like that. And I say why? Because you don't want it all to happen today. Amen. Amen. Do you want it all today? I want God to spread my stuff out. Give me enough time to pray. Give me enough time to get on my knees and call on Jesus. In other words, God, I know it's going to be something after something because the Bible says all that live godly are going to suffer. So you're going to go through something. But the psalmist here, his problem was he was overwhelmed with grief. And in fact, in Psalm 73, he admits God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. He says, God is good. Don't get it twisted. God is good. I, I recognize God is good. But sometimes people still get on my nerves. Yeah. That's what he's saying. God is good. And even to those who have a clean heart, he's good to them. He blessed them. He's an awesome God. He's an on-time God. He's a miraculous God. He's a merciful God. He's a compassionate God. I know God is good. But my problem, he says, if you go with me in Psalm 73, he says God is good. In fact, the church is good. That's right. You say, what do you mean, preacher? It's God's church. We started a series just recently, and I want to just encourage you, those of you who can, to come out and pray me. We started a series on the purpose of God's church. Yeah. And listen to what I read to them. It said, the church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of me. Yeah. It was organized for service. As bad as the church is, I don't think you all are leaving. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm going to, I, this is what it's called, the homiletical block. i got to create the tension. i got to tell you, in the church, you're going to have problems. i got to tell you, folks don't get on your nerve. But i got to tell you, also, the church is going to go through. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So you got to buckle up your seatbelt and hang in there and hang around people who are just like you. Because sometimes we get nerved by folks because they so much like us. they got so much in them that's so much in me that we all messed up. We all sinners saved by grace. In fact, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There are none righteous, no, not one. That's probably why we got so many problems, because we so much like each other. Amen. Now, our symptoms may vary, but the root problem is our lack of trust in God. Amen. 
and it shows up from time to time. But I'm so glad that we serve a God that says his church is going to go through. And upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. It was organized for service, we said. It is the mission to carry the gospel to the world. From the beginning, it has been God's plan that through the church shall be reflected to the world his fullness and his sufficiency. In other words, it's God's purpose that the church would express and show and expose God's goodness to a world. But sometimes, even in Zechariah, the problem was that they lost their witness, and their witness was lost as a byproduct because of the problems they dealt with in their life. See, their witness was not something they went out to kill on their own. In other words, you don't say, I don't want to witness. You don't say, I don't want to share the glory of God. Nobody want to eclipse the glory of God. Nobody wants to take glory from God. But saints of God, if you're honest with yourself, the problems you deal with in your life, the things you've got to overcome or the things that's overcoming you, sometimes inhibit us from giving a witness for because we've got so much we're dealing with in our lives that's that's un, 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 unfulfilled and that's not dealt with in a way that gives God glory. In other words, there's so much stuff that I'm dealing with that I'm no longer focused on witnessing. I'm focusing myself. And begin to take my eyes off of Jesus. The psalmist says, the church is God's church. I realize that. But for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. He said, I almost lost my way. I, in fact, he tells us what happened in verse 3. He says, what happened, I became envious of the foolish when I saw their prosperity. He said, what happened was, I was situated and planted in the house of God. I knew I was in the right place. I knew I was doing what God wanted me to do. But when I started looking around at what was going on around me, when I started looking even at people in the church, you can see his problem is not smoking. His problem is not drinking. His problem is not drugs. His problem is not sex or lying or stealing. But his problem is I started looking at other people. I started looking at them, and then when I saw what was going on in their life, I became a little envious because I started looking at what they had opposed to what God had given me. I became centered on that. The problem is, when we take our eyes off of Jesus, and we start looking at other human beings, and saints, I want you to know it's easy to get discouraged when you look at somebody else who look like they're better off than you. Look like. They say the grass is always greener on the other side, but sometimes it's just plain old artificial turf. You gotta remember that even though you smile all the time, it's not always what you think it is. Sometimes somebody can be going through something and they just know how to hold it in and they know how to praise God. You look at them and see what they're driving. Look at them and see where they're living. And you want it to, but you don't understand the pain that they've gone through. You don't understand the price they paid. There's a price tag on everything. And the psalmist said, what happened for me, I started looking at other people and I saw how their life was so different than mine. I became envious of them and I almost lost my step. Serving God. Frank, right there, right there in Psalm 73. Let's look at this text. The Bible says, For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They're not in trouble like other people. In other words, he concluded that they don't have problems. And it's easy to look around just for a moment. So you can, you can see a snapshot of a person and look like they're not in problems. But everybody is going through something. And part of the reason why it's hard for us to deal with other people is that I don't give them the benefit of doubt or understand what they're going through to realize they got problems also. See, I can love people a little more if I understood and became a little more sympathetic to recognize that they got problems just like I have problems and we all got problems. Therefore, it becomes imperative that I help somebody because we all are going through something. The psalmist says they don't have trouble. And that's a big assumption. They don't have trouble like other men. Neither, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, they have pride to pass them about as a chain of violence. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than their heart could wish. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, saints, I, I, 
I, I gotta admit, when I when I when I read about somebody building a 38,000 square foot home, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can just take you know eight. <laughs> and you read about the millions. Now I will tell you, I'm not gonna hate on money. The Bible says the root of or the love of money is the root of all evil. It didn't say money was the problem. So don't think this preacher is raining on money. In fact, they tell me money is not everything, but it ranks right up there with oxygen. <laughs> So don't, don't get it twisted. Don't, don't think I got a problem with money today. I would like to have a little bit more. I ain't going to lie. But I don't want to lose the soul trying to get it. Now, if the Lord want to bless somebody, you hear people say, well, I don't want to get rich because I might be lost. Well, Lord, you can try me. Amen. Come <laughs> on, I might lose my soul. But think being poor make them a little more pious. But think if I look pious, I'm a broke God says, what well, I don't, the Lord won't take it away anyhow. No, if you can be blessed now, the Bible says, occupy till I come. In other words, if you can be blessed now, be blessed so you can help somebody. But don't let what you're occupying hinder you when he comes. There's nothing wrong with money, but the problem with the psalmist is he has a, he's got it all confused. He thinks that probably it's permanent when it's not. See, the biggest problem, saints, we've got to deal with is that we've got to recognize we're pilgrims passing through, and this is not our home. We're just going through and sojourning. This is not our country. We're like Abraham, and we can't get caught up and enamored by the lights and the glitter, what we see in this life. We've got heaven to gain and a hell to shun, and we've got to walk by faith and not by sight. We've got to trust the Lord when we can't trace Him. And the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into thy own understanding, but acknowledge God, and he will direct your step. Keep your eyes stayed on him, and he will keep you in perfect peace. But the problem with the psalmist is, he's looking at other people opposed to looking at God. Yeah. And notice things here, I told you I'm not going to keep you long, but it's going to be a quick, 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 just right to the point word. The Bible says, in fact, verse 11, and they say, how does God know? He begins to ask the question, in fact, they say, how does God know? There is a God right now who's watching over everything. Yeah. Now, if somebody doing you wrong, don't you try to get them. You wait on God. He says, revenge is mine. I will repay. Amen. Amen. I tell people all the time, if you try to get them back, you might shortchange them. God may want to give them a little bit more. So you get out of the way. Trust in the Lord. Wait on God. Your husband is not doing right. Your wife not doing right. Your kids not doing right. You pray to God and God himself will straighten it out. You've got to learn to trust God and have faith in God. In other words, he says, and, and they say, how does God know? He knows. He's watching everything. Believe me, there's a tag that's being taken. God right now is watching everything. In fact, they tell me it's called investigative judgment going on right now. I'm so glad God gives me the benefit of doubt even though he already knows the end. He lets me make a statement with my own life. He gives me time. Right. In other words, say God does know. He's omniscient, all-knowing. He is so powerful. He knows everything there is to ever know. I told you before, his only handicap, he can't learn. <laughs> well, let that marinate. What an awesome God we serve. He can't learn. Wow. He can't learn. Well, we're going to put him back a couple of grades. He can't learn. Why? Because he knows all there is. Can you imagine? Truth, uh, it, it, it reveals itself to us. It unfolds. I learn something new every day. Something every day is exposed in my life. You learn something every day. But with God, nothing is new. You can't surprise him or shock him. Even with your life, he's not even disappointed, even with your failures, because expectation, when they're not met, brings frustration. And therefore, he can't expect anything because he already knows. So you can't disappoint him because he already knows what you're going to do before you do it. 
They make provision already for what you're going to do. Therefore, God does know. The psalmist got it wrong. He says, is there knowledge in the most high? Yes, there is. My God, he sits high, but he looks low. He is watching. Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper. And this is what his problem is. And in verse 13, he goes so far to say, I joined the church in vain. I got saved, and everybody else seemed like they're blessed. But that's what he's saying, saints. And then finally he says, when I thought to know this in verse 16, it was too painful for me. The more I thought about it, the more it hurt. The more I thought about it, the more it hurt. You would ask anybody if you just keep getting hurt by what you think about, stop thinking about it. But it was that bad, he couldn't even stop thinking about it. The more I thought about it, in fact, that means he was pondering it. He was meditating on it. He thought about it. He said, I thought about it. And the more I thought about it, and the more it pained me. I got upset with it. In other words, he says, it bothered me to the point I didn't know where to go. But then verse 17, you heard it before. He says, until I went into what everybody? The sanctuary. He said, it made no sense of this until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I therein. There's something that's powerful about the sanctuary that the people of God need to understand. God gave us the testimony of the sanctuary as a coloring book to show us how God is going to deal with sin. In other words, in the Old Testament, God showed us that a lamb would die for sinful man. But in the Old Testament, the sanctuary then becomes a lesson book. It becomes a plan on how God is going to strategically pull sin from the sinner without destroying the sinner's personality. The sanctuary service is an awesome, awesome display of how this awesome, powerful, holy, awesome God says, I'm going to build them a sanctuary. Why? That I might dwell among them, which means it's always God's desire to be with his people. Sin separates us from God. But God said, I want to come close to them. Emmanuel, God with us. God wants to dwell with me. God wants to go to my house. God wants to live in my life. God wants to be in my heart. God wants to overcome me. In other words, he says, in the sanctuary, I now understand more than I ever understood before. The sanctuary begins to unfold truths that this church preaches that most other churches or no other church is preached. For in the sanctuary, number one, I can learn there, I can't trust my flesh. That's what I learned in the sanctuary. I learned that when I sin, I got to bring a lamb and an innocent lamb has to die for me. I understand in the sanctuary that I can't trust my flesh. We were talking about that in the lesson and that's why I said I wanted to bring it right here. Because many of us think that when we talk about being perfect, we think that before Christ comes back, and we read statements, that before he comes back, we must be perfect. What does that mean? What does that mean? The Bible says we are justified without the deeds of the law. Amen. Romans and Galatians talks about how a man is made right with God. Yes. But when we go to the sanctuary, we see there how God makes us right. It's the innocent dying for the guilty. And before the guilty even do anything, yes. it's the innocent saying, I'll cover your sins. And therefore, the Bible says we're justified without the deeds of the law. There's no performance that I can ever do to make me right with God. That's right. That's right. My good works will never bring me credit to God. That's right. I want to be clear on that. In other words, I don't care how well you perform, God is not turned on how good you are, and he's not turned off on how bad you are. He is God, and he changed not. He will always be God, but the way a sinner is made right with God when he acknowledges his deficiency and say like Paul, I can't trust myself. I'm going to look to Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, and confess my sins over him. And then in exchange, I once was lost, but now I'm saved. And therefore, the issue is this, my brothers and sisters. See, before the fall of man, he was perfect. Can you imagine no appetite for evil? No appetite to do wrong. No desire to sin. See, temptation comes now and we, we look. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
First look, you bless the Lord, but then if you look again, you're in trouble. <laughs> something pulls inside of us. That there's something that goes off inside of me. In other words, every time I, there's a pull, see, we've got to get to the point maybe where then we don't feel the pull. And so therefore, when Adam sinned against God, now he had an appetite for sin. But the issue was, can a perfect person, in the beginning, get this, can a perfect person keep God's law? That was the real issue. In heaven, the issue was about God's law. And when God made Adam and Eve, he wanted to show from some unbiased people that his law could be kept. And when Adam and Eve were created, we said again that the tree was not going to be there permanently. It was there as a test of loyalty where they stood with God. You say, well, why did God put the tree there in the first place? I have young people say that. Why did God put the tree there in the first place? Well, if I told you to go in the house, I lock all the doors from the outside, all the windows from the outside, and tell you don't come out, you have no choice. If God had put no tree there, Adam and Eve would obey by no choice. That's right. But God says you can only mature and grow when choice is presented. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's no maturation, no development unless you have a choice. That's why I don't believe in the law of where you can legislate stuff like alcohol and drinking and, 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 and the adult the lion club and take them all away. The more we try to want to just take all evil away. You can take all the evil away you want. We're going to find a way to see it. <laughs> Amen. From toddlers on up, you born in sin. You don't become a sinner as you get older. You born a sin. When you were a baby, you were a sinner. You said, well, you never did anything. It's your nature. Amen. And the only reason why you don't sin like you could is because you've got bigger people that will give you the WWF beat now when you act up. <laughs> Therefore, cause and effect says, if I do this, this is going to happen. And you learn not to do that because you don't like that when it happens. I don't know about you, but I learned that growing up when my father would just remind me every now and then about doing wrong. I, I, there's something that happens when you put pressure on the gluteus maximus. It does something to the mutons and the new and the neurons in the brain. You, you start acting better and it does something to you. In fact, I have flashbacks even now. <laughs> We're born sinners by nature. And the only way I can overcome that is not by doing better or doing good, but only by getting the nature of Christ. Yeah, yeah. Now, now the issue is this. I'm going to let you go. See, see, when Adam was perfect, did right. He had the power of choice. He had the power to act on choice. Are we clear on that? He had the power of choice. He could choose and then he had power to act on it. Now, after the fall of man, we only have the power of choice. Amen. And you say, well, I can act on my choice for a little while. You can do good for a while. Then something will happen. And you're like, I'm going to love you, baby. I'm going to love you. I'm not going to do... Later on, about two weeks from now, just in person I We can do good for a while. But then that nature's going to kick in. Why? Because by nature, we are sinners. But the issue is this thing. This is the real issue. Adam and Eve failed, and God said, okay, give me what Adam had. And this is what people talk about, the nature of Christ. I can't be like him. Because he was perfect. It's a good thing he was perfect. Why? Because the issue is no longer over. Can an imperfect person keep a perfect law? That's what we argue. Right. <laughs> That's the wrong argument. We argue, can an imperfect people keep a perfect law? Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Okay. You say, well, yes, I can. I'm going to tell you why. Our nature won't let us. That's right. 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 Law of gravity is going to pull you down. However, this is the controversy that's going on right now. The problem that we're dealing with now is after Christ came, 
perfect Savior lived on this planet for 33 years and didn't sin not one time. He said, the devil comes and he can't find anything in me. I mean, he did everything. And Jesus, I mean, man, that was awesome. He didn't even flinch. The devil did everything he could to buy him out. And Jesus didn't even give in not one time by fault or behavior. He didn't even think about doing wrong. Now, can you imagine on the cross when they said come down, if he had thought about coming down. If he just thought about it, he would have come down and they would have all been in trouble. Us too. But they didn't even think about coming down. Back while he was dying, follow and give them while they're doing what they're doing. He was perfect. Praise God. There was no sin in him. But he had the very nature of Adam. But Adam, the difference from him, he had 4,000 years of a curse that's on this planet through the genes of men that he was born in this on this planet. And he came, and the Bible says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? He lived in the cesspool, in the ghetto, in the hood, and didn't mess up one time. He was born during the Roman time, the, the world at its worst, and he came and he showed us, he's showing us that a perfect person can trust God. Yes. yes, but that's not the issue, Jesus. We sinners now. How can we overcome? The issue now, my brothers and sisters, is sin. Will imperfect people trust a perfect Christ who kept the perfect? See, see, that's the issue. Our, our issue is not with being obedient. Our issue is with Jesus. What are you going to do with him? That's why they said, what should you do with Christ? They said, crucify him. Give us Barabbas. Today, the issue is, what are you doing with Jesus? If you accept him into your life, he says, if any man be in Christ, he becomes a new creation. Old things pass away. And now when Christ comes inside of me, by faith, he begins to give me strength to overcome those tendencies that I could not overcome on my own. It's all about falling in love with Jesus, having a resolve that I'm going to follow him. I'm going to press towards the mark. I'm not going to give up. See, the devil wants to work on weakening your resolve about Jesus. That's why the Bible says there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. At the name of Jesus, every knee going to bow, every tongue going to confess. It's because of Jesus. That's why in major religions, you don't find a Jesus because if Jesus is not in it, that's salvation by works. I need Jesus. They say, well, you all are legalists because you keep the law. No, we can't keep the law. It's Christ inside of me that gives me power to keep the law. And that's why he says, if you love me, keep Keep my commandments. We're not keeping them to be saved. I'm keeping them because I'm already saved. Amen. See, when you go in the sanctuary, you learn you can't trust your flesh. Secondly, you learn that God is your strength. See, thank God. Well, God, you have to have that devotion time. I've got to turn to him morning by morning. i got to get to know him. That's how you overcome. In other words, he says not only that, the wicked will perish. I learned that when I go to the sanctuary. See, the evil folk are one day going to be gone. That's why it says, fret not yourself with evildoers. We need to work on not being evildoers ourselves. Because one day, they're going to be gone. And you say, well, why do they live so long now? You see, that the reason why God allows them so much time is because this may be, if well, the truth is, this is all they're going to get. That's right. That's right. This is it. You die at 12 and somebody died at 100, saints. That's all they got, 100. But you died at 12 and you know what the word says, the dead in Christ. We learned this from the sanctuary. The dead in Christ going to rise up first and they're going to put on immortality and this corruptible. They're going to put on incorruption at 12. Yes, I might have a pause at 12, but I've got eternity now. Death is not the final answer. It's only a comma in the life of the believer because he that shall come will come. And when those clouds roll back like a scroll, and the dead in Christ rise up out the grave like popcorn on a hot grill. I don't know about you, but I want to be there. I want to look up and say, this is my God. I waited for him. And I want to hear him say, hello. He said, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Saints, you just got to walk through this life by faith. You got to keep your eyes on Jesus and spend time with him in the morning. I don't know, you might be an evening person. You might be an afternoon. The issue is not legislating time, but the issue is spending some time with God. Yeah. Yeah. Getting to know 
him. Falling in love with him. Getting to know him for yourself. Not what somebody else said. Not what somebody else told you. But taste and see that the Lord is good. Get to know him for yourself. I should spend time just getting closer to God. Every Sabbath service, when I come to church, I should understand it's time with God. And you might say, I'm struggling through something. You spend time doing everything else. Spend time getting closer to God. Put that on your schedule. Eventually, as you spend more time with God, it will outweigh the time doing other stuff. The question is, even in your mind, what does it run back to when you finish doing what you're doing? When I'm talking to somebody, your mind should immediately run back to prayer. We were talking about that. You pray when you just say, Lord, help me. You pray when you say, God, have mercy. You pray when you say, Lord, give me strength. I've got to spend time with God. Saints, the question is not about how well I live, but what perfection, that's important. But more than anything, what you going to do with Jesus? Do you know him? That's the provision made for salvation. Getting to know him. Jesus, do you know him? That's why the Bible says in that day, many will say, Lord, Lord, did not preach in your name. Lord, did not prophesy. Did not cast out demons in your name. He will say, I didn't really know you. What do you mean, Lord? We didn't have a relationship. Therefore, department. It's not a base. It's not based on my works. It's not based on what I do. It's based on who I know. Amen. And the question today is, do you know him? That's your perfection. Your resolve and your, your love for Jesus tells you where you are in your walk with God. You don't love Jesus, got a problem. That's the issue. Because the Bible tells us his power can help you overcome your tendencies. Whatever, you, whatever you're dealing with, you can overcome it. But he made provision. But he said, it is finished. It's done. It's not one problem you will engage in your life that he's not made provision for you to overcome. That's a good word. You might think you're singular. And you can't overcome something because your problem is you need not. He got you. Because he was tempted at all points that he did not see. Today... I'm closing right now. You want to say yes to God. I don't know who you are, but you know where you are in your Christian journey. It's enough to make you want to lose your mind when you look around and see all this stuff going on in the world. It's enough to confuse you when you see good people dying and evil look like it's overcoming. But God got you. He's going to fix it. He's going to fix it. Why? Because he said he would. Coming back, and my reward is with me. Yeah. Don't you want to be ready? Yeah. Don't you want to be ready? Raise your hand. You want to be ready? Don't you want to be ready? Oh, God bless you. Somebody else might want to be ready, but they, not, they have not yet accepted Christ as their Savior. Today, you want to do that right now. There were those who joined last week. We're going to have a big baptism next month. You might want to say, I want to be in it. I want to prepare for that baptism. I want to give my life to Christ today. I want to give Jesus my heart. I want to give him my life. I want to walk right now. The church is designed as an agency of salvation. It was placed here by God to assist and help individuals get saved. And today, you want to say yes to him right now. I'm not going to make a long appeal. This is right now. This is your moment right now. You want to come. You can come. Whatever we have to do to help you, we're going to help you. By like God's grace, you want to say yes to him right now. The Lord wants you to come, wherever you are. You'll walk by grace. The Bible says the path of the just shines more and more. Today you want that. You want salvation. You want that today. That's why you came. We're praying now, and even during this prayer, if you feel the pull of God, come. Others have raised their hand in reconsecration. But before you leave here, you want to say, yes, God, I want to make sure it's right with you. You can come. I'm praying, Father. Thank you for being so transparent in the book of Psalms. But through inspired writings, you allow us to see their pain in their heart. But Lord, you always have a way of straightening it up, showing us truth, 
showing us that you're in control. Showing us that ultimately you're going to be back again. And right now I pray for every believer. Those who raise their hands testifying that they want to be ready when you come. I pray for power in their lives. I pray for strength to overcome. Lord, when we leave this service, the enemy will continue to attack us. It's not my neighbor, it's not my husband or wife, not my children. It's something inside of me, Lord, that I'm warring with. Yeah. I gotta overcome it, Father, by your grace. If I let go and let God, strength will come. And Father, I pray that you would help everyone under the sound of my voice today. It's not by accident that we're here, but you want to save us. Thank you for the seed, the word of hope that you dropped in our lives. We realize, Lord, we're justified by your grace and your mercy. But you said, if you love me, keep my commandments. It is your love that enables us to obey you. It is your power that you place inside of us that helps us to do right. Doing right does not save us. It's because we are saved that we do right. And you're looking for a church, Lord, that made a covenant with you by sacrifice. So I pray that you'll save us. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.